Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome President and CEO Hyatt Hotels, Mark Hoplamazian, in discussion with Skift founder and CEO Rafat Ali. So, um, let me remind you, there obviously is a QA at the end of this. If you go to the, to the app, you should be able to ask the question from there. You can start asking now if you want to. And also, you can go to slider.com and put the hashtag skip forum. You should be able to get the questions in. Uh, and we'll choose, hopefully, we'll be able to get to like two or three questions. So, um, Mark, thank you for being here. It's a great pleasure. And uh, congratulations on what has been an incredible journey for Skift. Thank you. Appreciate Amazing, it. Amazing uh, announcements this morning. I'm thrilled for you and, and excited to see the growth. Appreciate it. So Mark has the distinction of being um, the only speaker who's opened Skiff Forum twice now. Uh, he was the main speaker. He was the opening speaker at our 2015 event in Brooklyn, Brooklyn. which you liked a lot. The I venue. Love, that venue is amazing. <laughs> and, and now you're back. That was more of a talk. This is more of a QA. and a So let's get into it. You, you, a few minutes ago, maybe an hour ago, you sent this memo to your whole team that you will stop accepting hate groups at hotels, at your hotels. Yes. You've had some history with it. Yes. Explain. Um, well, you know, um, hotels are uh, open, open forums for many types of groups. And so over our 60-year period, we've had many different types of groups that have uh, convened meetings in our hotels. Um, as we have reflected a lot on our values and our purpose as a company, which is to care for people so they can be their best, um, we really started to reflect and revisit many things that we're doing within the company to make sure that we continue to reinforce our purpose and be able to put us in a position to fulfill our purpose, and also to really make sure that we're doing things that are going to allow our colleagues and other guests and other people that are in our hotels to be their best. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, today is UN World Tourism Day, and, and the values around that are about um, you know, gaining an understanding of the world through travel. And um, that means uh, really uh, being in a position where you feel um, that your, your uh, position and your identity is respected. And so groups that are primarily focused on demeaning and disparaging other people just and because of you, their... How do you figure that part out? Well, uh, it's a, it is a complex uh, evaluation. There's no question about it, because um, a group, one group that might be um, uh, you know, disfavored by someone might be, uh, someone else might champion. But really, at the, at the core of it, it's if a group is primarily focused on disparaging another group by virtue of their identity, by virtue of their immutable characteristics, whether that's your sexual orientation or your, or your, or your race or your religion, um, that's really where we need to draw the line. And um, it's going to be a complex equation. We're not going to be perfect about it. I'm sure we will make mistakes over time. But we, we are going to apply ourselves to it, and we're going to apply our values in making those decisions along the way. What if the owner of the hotels, because your asset light company increasingly, uh, or the management company, et cetera, are they, they push back? Well, I think the, the fact is that uh, as we look at it holistically, we want to make sure that the environment we're creating within our hotels is one in which our colleagues, first and foremost, and others who are there feel safe, not just physically safe, but emotionally safe and psychologically safe. Um, that will promote great business over time. And I, I think it'll put us in a position to do better and better. And I would also just point out that these groups don't represent a, a particularly significant amount of total business. It's not, it's not as though we're, we're having these things confront us all the time. Mm -hmm. it's, it's actually quite infrequent, but an important dividing line to continue to reinforce what we So the challenge stand that, for. for instance, platforms like Facebook and others are facing, you are facing in, in real life. Yes. Um, speaking of hatred, um, you met Mr. Trump uh, recently. <laughs> Um, President Trump recently, um, as part of the uh, of U.S. Travel Association's group, you're part of it, obviously, as Correct. well. You met him, yes. uh, I think, about a month ago, maybe three weeks ago, maybe. That's right. Um, what did, did you hear anything that assures you in any possible way? 
Well, the purpose of the visit was really to focus on things that we we're trying to promote as an industry, which is um, specifically from a US perspective, extending a message of a warm welcome to the rest of the world, which um, we feel is critical. And our pitch was, you know, that actually is most effective when it comes from the top. Um, and we didn't get any commitments on that, on that point, but I think we made, we made our, stated our case. The second thing we talked about was the freedom of travel. Mm -hmm. And we reviewed the incredible positive impact that things like uh, the visa waiver program uh, have generated. I mean, significant increases in travel from countries where we've actually linked up and had a visa waiver program put into place. And we, we cited those statistics to try to uh, illustrate the value, the exportation value of travel, because people coming to the US and spending money is, um, is the most direct form of export you can have. But all of this we know. Yes, this but- It's all common sense. Yes, but somehow I think the, the re-emphasis about actually turning back to some of these um, things that have not really advanced since this administration's been in office, um, we, we did make uh, significant uh, progress in reducing the number of days it takes for Chinese and Indian and, and uh, Brazilian travelers. Those, those three countries mm -hmm. in particular were, were, were significantly backed up. So they went from several months to several days as opposed to um, in, in each of those cases. Right. Um, but we feel like refocusing attention on it needs to, we, that we need to actually refocus attention on it because right now so much of the, um, of the general dialogue is around uh, trade things mm -hmm. that are uh, that are missing the point with respect to travel in particular, and so we believe that some refocusing was really necessary. Um, we had uh, Larry Kudlow in the meeting, uh, a member of the chief of staff's right. uh, team, as well as Ivanka Trump, and um, and I think we we were able to get through to a commitment for them to go back and take a look at policies that are in place that they could actually do something about that will free up travel. We'll see how it evolves, but we've, we, felt, we feel like we need to go and continue to advocate for this. This right. is really important to, to so the industry. About 80% of your portfolio is US? Yes. 80% of your revenues are US? Yes. 20% outside? Right. Are you seeing any effect of just in the last year, two years? All of the data, especially for this year, have, has shown actually an increase in inbound travel. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there are always considerations that you have to take into account, like currency changes. But we don't see any impact, uh, negative impact, with respect to inbound foreign travel at this point. OK. So um, let's get into some of the business aspects of Hyatt. So you've done a lot in the last year to restructure the company. Yep. Um, you've consolidated a lot of things under the chief commercial officer. He is also named Mark. Yeah. Um, has hired a new chief digital officer. You just hired a chief wellness officer as well. Mia, I think she's either here or hopefully will be. Um, and um, you bought Miraval, you bought Exhale, um, you tried to buy NH. What is happening? <laughs> a lot, obviously. <laughs> so a uh, couple of things. One, organizationally. Um, there's so many intersections across the areas that you cited, uh, loyalty, distribution, revenue management, um, sales, and, um, and in our case, we also have a significant effort around well-being, and the intersection of all of those things has to do with how we are engaging with and how we are I interacting with and how we are presenting ourselves to our guests. And so having all of those functions in, under one uh, leadership team uh, was really a, a critical step forward to increase our speed of reaction and increase our agility. So we stood up a number of things in the space of a very short period of time. We launched a new uh, credit card. Uh, we launched a partnership with uh, small luxury hotels mm -hmm. um, to link into our loyalty Lord. program, adding up to 500 and over 500 hotels into, into people's selections, mostly in Europe. Um, we also launched a, a digital experience platform called Find, which is very highly focused on well-being uh, offerings. Oh, Find? F-I-N-D. OK. Um, and it is available through the World of Hyde platform. World of Hyde is our loyalty program, our loyalty platform. 
Um, and we've also launched some initiatives on the sales side, mostly in the luxury space, mm -hmm. hi highly focusing on uh, luxury travel advisors. And so when you, when you look at each one of those things, they kind of make sense in their own domain, but when you have the ability to link them across, it, there's a lot more power to it. But we were able to stand all these things up in, in very short order, and part of, it, it, part of the design of the organization was increase the speed to market. We've got to move faster. And so the larger vision of Hyatt moving beyond hotels is what? So first, you have to start with purpose. Um, I mentioned earlier that we were really focused on caring for people so they can be their best. Um, we are serving and focused on the high-end traveler. We are not playing right. every segment down to mid-scale. But wasn't that what you were going to do with NH if you were successful? Well, I think um, NH had a different proposition associated with it that had more to do with the geography. Right. Um, and not as strong in Europe. Correct. Um, but they, they also had a number of hotels that, um, that, that operate at the higher end as well. But yes, the core of their, their business is, is more what, what we would describe as maybe upscale right. or select service, um, which is we, we actually do participate in the select service segment. So first and foremost, the lens that we're looking through is who's our customer and what are we going to be doing for them? Um, the idea behind World of Hyatt, the platform, was we want to engage our guests and our customers, our travel planners and, and uh, travel advisors, we want to engage them in ways that are highly relevant to them. So for a hotel company, the frequency of, of staying with us and interacting with our brand is relatively low for most people. So how do you increase relevancy and frequency? Well, the answer is you don't strictly look through the lens of being a hotel company. Look through the lens of what your customers are looking for and make sure that you can actually deliver something that's really unique and compelling, and that's really what led us to well-being. Um, for us, it, it's a perfect way to fulfill purpose because in order to have someone be their best, they have to be their best selves. And a holistic sense of well-being was really the core to that. Um, we chose, within well-being, which is a broad category, right. we chose a couple of platforms that are informed, all of the programming that they do is informed by mindfulness. That's a, that's a subspace, if you will, that right. we think is, is pretty much wide open at this mm -hmm. point. Um, a lot of companies are turning to mindful practices to help people be uh, better centered, more effective, more productive, um, but healthier as well. There are health outcomes that are clear. Right. So we're looking to try to in, embed a mindful approach to nutrition, to exercise, to meditation, and mental well-being as well. And we're doing that in many different dimensions, including some significant at-scale pilots for our colleagues. Um, we're starting a 6,000-person pilot now, um, that later in October, um, that is focused around holistic well-being and mindful practices. So a year into Miraval, what are the lessons? Or the early lessons? First, uh, we believed, uh, and I think you do too, because you just launched uh, your Skiff wellness, wellness yeah, Skiff Wellness, that there's a tremendous level of demand for uh, well-being offerings. And um, so our resort in Tucson, which we've expanded, um, has seen tremendous demand levels. Um, we are a couple of months away from opening. With a higher RevPAR type yes. opportunities there? Yes. Um, I just used the word RevPAR. I've never, ever used the word RevPAR. It's state. not really RevPAR. I mean, the way I think about Miraval is there are about 95 offerings when you show up on property. And so, honestly, the, what you're paying for your room is a small proportion of what your total experience is about mm -hmm. um, because there's so many different offerings. And some of it is to allow you to challenge yourself. Some of it is... Um, to celebrate your physical well-being if you're in that mode. Some of it is to recover from a life event. But there are many different dimensions of how you can do that, and discovering that path on your own is really what we're there to facilitate. But the demand level has been phenomenal. We're opening a new Miraval in Austin uh, later uh, in a couple of months, and then mid-year next year we'll open a new one in the Berkshires in Lenox, Massachusetts. But more than that, we've really tapped the expert and the ex experts and the expertise within Miraval to pull mindfulness into offerings within Hyatt. Um, and we're starting with our colleagues to make sure we help them be their best. But we also are working right now on some pilots for meetings to help 
meeting planners and our corporate customers to be able to embed some, um, some programming well being into it. that really will allow their meetings to be that much more effective. Mm -hmm. And it, it'll be unique um, programming because we have experts who've been doing this for decades. So I'm, that's what I'm really excited about. I think we can really elevate um, the whole experience and have a, a fundamentally different type of experience that's not just a different breakfast buffet right. or a different lighting scheme. So you, uh, you have some cash to put to work. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, NH didn't work out. Um, what will you buy? What are the types of things you care for now? Yeah. I know China has been a big focus for you. 20% revenues outside US are very small compared to what I'm sure what you want. Yeah. What are you looking at? So uh, a couple of, couple of clear areas. First of all, we, as I mentioned before, we, we participate between um, upscale and luxury. And so within that, within that uh, range of segments, uh, we would be thrilled to add some additional brands um, if, they, if they are unique and have uh, real brand equity associated with them. Uh, we are focused on buying brands and brand platforms as opposed to more real estate assets. Mm -hmm. um, so it will be quote unquote asset light in terms of what we focus on. Right. Um, Asia continues to be an area of high focus for us. Uh, when you look at the travel statistics, by the way, five, six years ago when you decided to launch into this, this industry, you, you chose beautifully. Because over that period of time, travel has grown at about one, one and a half times the rate of GDP right. ar around the world. But in Asia, it's more like twice the rate of GDP growth. So your launch of, of Skift Asia is also well yeah, suited. Yeah, we think so too, yeah. Yeah, so I think you, you've nailed it, right? This is the, this is the, this is the place to be. Um, and so we, we think Asia continues to be critically important. And, and we're focused on geographies where we have relatively lighter representation. Europe is one of those areas that hence our interest in NH. Um, and uh, there are other places in South America where I would love to grow faster. So it's really, it's really experiences and brands within that, that serve our customer base, mm -hmm. that higher end customer base. Um, Asia has a special focus, and then other geographies uh, in which we have. And then talk about China strategy. Where, where are you with that? I know that yeah. you talked about it in the last earnings call as well. Yeah, we have tremendous growth already in place in China. We have uh, 60 hotels open and operating, and we'll double that What's over the, the next What are the brands years. you're going in with? Um, our full brand portfolio. So we have every brand represented either open. 14 now? Uh, no, uh, there are 10, hospital, 10 hotel brands. Right. Um, we have all of our brands represented other than our all-inclusive brands, but we believe that all-inclusive can work in China in certain mm. markets. Um, so we have Hyde Ziva and Hyde Zalara that are our two all-inclusive brands. Um, but, so the growth itself is significant. Hyde Place and Hyde House, which are our select service offerings at a lower price point, I think will have tremendous growth potential because we can open those in many more markets. But we're also looking to potential uh, additional ways in which we can grow uh, both faster and more effectively with local partners. We uh, struck a partnership with a local group um, in Chengdu called Minyun Hospitality, and we're doing a number of Hyde Place and Hyde House developments with them. And we're working on a couple of other uh, really interesting potential alignments in the partnerships with local players, mm -hmm. um, both in relation to um, hotel offerings, but also a way in which we can enhance our digital engagement with our customers in China, which is a whole different world. Right. Um, um, let's dig into the all-inclusive resort because you mentioned that. So you've been a, you've been doing that for for years now. The all-inclusive resort. Now other brands are getting into it as yeah. well. How do you see the all-inclusive resort expanding? First of all, or evolving yeah. from your perspective. I think it's it is uh, remains a very popular format for a lot of travelers, especially in certain resort locations. Um, in order for it to work, you have to have access, relatively close access to a relatively large airport mm -hmm. because you have to have volumes of people that come through. Um, and they have to be of a certain size because if you're going to have someone on property experiencing the offerings of that property over a four or five day period, you, you need multiple outlets, multiple restaurants, multiple things to do. And in order to do that, you have to have enough people to really populate that and, and have it work. So that, the resorts tend to be relatively larger, more than 500 rooms. Mm -hmm. um, and there are many markets like that in the Caribbean and in Mexico. Which that, is where you have a bunch of property. Which is re really where we're concentrated right. currently. But it's also true that if you look in the south of Spain or the north, northern coast of Africa or 
um, just starting now in India, just starting. Mm -hmm. And uh, we believe in Asia as well, Thailand, China. Do you know um, who you should buy? Pardon me? Six senses. <laughs> Be a good one. I didn't realize I was going to get M&A advice when I came, well, so advice. that's really good. <laughs> As you're thinking about Asia, because all-inclusive, obviously, they're big in it on the luxury end of the, of the thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> struggles with home sharing. So you have had a couple of goals at it. Yep. Uh, you invested in what was one fine stay initially. Yes. Did the right down. They sold to a core, not for, not for a lot. We didn't um, take it right down. We got our money back. You got our we, yeah, we, money we, back. Okay. Yeah, we invested and got our money back they when Aqua, right. Right. Never mind. They, they took the write down. Not yes, us. but you just did a 22 million charge. You invested in, I'm forgetting the name of it. Oasis. Oasis, Oasis not Ovation. Yeah. Um, what, what is, what's missing? In First your of all, what, what, what isn't missing is the demand for alternatives to hotels for certain purposes of visit or, or stay occasions. Um, and so we see in our own customer base uh, real demand for a home option in many cases, um, which is why we're still drawn to the space. Uh, the fact is that subsequent to the time that we invested in Oasis, um, the regulatory environment changed pretty significantly. There's been a wave of new legislation and new regulations that have been put into place in so many markets across the United that States. That doesn't seem to be hurting Airbnb. Um, I'm not sure that that's true. Okay. Um, I, I would say I think there's, there's been a documented decline in their inventory in a few key markets. And the, and the real legislation that's going to have, I think, a bigger impact in New York takes hold in 2019. Correct. That would be the big test. And I think it's going to be significant. And so I think that there's an evolution of what's going on with these platforms. I think uh, for, for companies that have focused on control, whether that's by way of lease or ownership of their inventory, uh, they have a basis on which they can actually take their model forward. It's harder to scale that and more expensive to scale that. Um, but you do have a direct control over the product that you're ultimately offering. And so I do think that there's going to be likely to be additional consolidation among platforms that do not have control over their inventory. Mm -hmm. And um, so we'll see how this goes. I mean, I, I think, honestly, uh, a year ago, even a year ago, I think people thought, you know, trees grow to the sky. And there is no limit. Airbnb will be worth $300 billion in two, two years' time. And it, I mean, some They're of them are not. Shocking, I know. Um, so I just think that, you know, the, there is a reality that's coming to roost here that, in a new legislative environment. So anyway, that's, that's where we stand. And I, um, I, I think that we have learned a huge amount on the B2B side. Oasis has about half of their business on the B2B right, front. Right. And on the B2C side, we see more opportunity on the B2C side. And we're going to continue to work on this until we figure out a model that can work for us. Um, let's move on to another topic. Cancellation policies at hotels changing yes. quite a bit, 48 to 24 hours. Um, where do you see that going? Well, uh, I think the market really is now at 48 hours. Uh, we made that change early this year, uh, except for our elite um, members of Hi World of Hyatt. They still have a 24-hour policy available to them. Sorry, 24 the to 48, correct. For, yeah, 24 to 48. The fact is that um, you know, there, was, there is a, just a, a higher level of demand, period. Occupancies are at record levels. Right. And so uh, in order to avoid the disruption that comes from last minute cancellations, hotels, when they are able to, will extend their cancellation policies. We had a, a large number of hotels, like 40% of our hotels in North America that had already extended to 48 hours or longer. Um, so we have a number of resorts, for example, that have 72 hour policies. Um, because the disruption from, from last minute cancellations, when you've got embedded demand or available demand is significant. So that's really what, it's, it's purely, a, it, it, it's driven by a supply and demand reality, but I think that that's where it will stay. So let's quickly jump into meetings and then corporate travel. So on the meeting side, there's also a bunch of movement where commissions are coming down. Some of the hotel groups, Marriott, I think has, was at the forefront of it. What is your policy? Well, um, we, right now, we've uh, maintained our commission structure for, with our partners. Uh, we continue to evaluate how things are evolving. So when is that announcement? Uh, uh, remains to be seen. I mean, we, we, we've been, we've been uh, closely keeping tabs on how this has evolved and how, how business has shifted uh, or not. 
over the course of the year. And uh, we, we live in an economic reality, and so I think the answer is we're not looking at this strictly from a cost perspective. We're looking at this from a total result perspective, that is revenue and cost. And our, we, we have excellent relationships with a lot of people who are uh, great partners, intermediaries and travel managers. And so what we want to do is continue to work with them to see if there's a differentiated, differentiated way in which we can actually uh, compete with them. So we'll see. OK. Uh, Copper Travel, you launched a small business uh, yes. offering as well. Yep. Uh, what's the thought they're going direct to small businesses? Yeah, I think the, the answer is that there's so many, first of all, the meetings business in hotels um, has continued to become a, more specialized in the main. Yes, there are still the, the market-wide conventions and, and big gatherings that happen mm -hmm. from time to time, but the average size of meetings has actually shrunk. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at the pharma business, when, when I started into the industry 12 years ago, the, the pharma business was just then moving out of primary care physician sales forces of five to 6,000 people into specialty sales forces of five to 600 people. Mm -hmm. That's a really different meeting, right. right? And that's true for lots and lots of meetings that are happening at our hotels. So the idea of actually making uh, gaining direct access to small and medium-sized businesses in meeting their needs in a different way directly um, makes a lot of sense to us because that's really where the core of the market is. Okay, let's get into the questions quickly. Um, the first one is from Eric. What technologies do you believe are impacting the hotel industry most? And how is Hyatt embracing it? If you can keep it short. I will. So technology to us is um, back to our purpose, a way to scale care. And we're focusing on how to make uh, life easier for our colleagues to be able to engage with guests. So taking friction out and um, simplifying the interface is one of the biggest advances. The second is really am amping up our digital uh, capabilities in relation to guest requests. Because right now, we have deployed within our, within our app the ability to make requests of any kind uh, and have a direct contact with someone on property, either through, as you choose, through SMS or within the app. Um, and this really has facilitated a, a faster service, but also a much better experience. So those are the two things I would say. Facilitating colleague experience and, and facilitating guest requests are the two big ones. Um, Azim asks, how do you compete with new Marriott from a loyalty standpoint, given the reality of a size compared to Hyatt? So our, our view is um, we, we're, we're, not trying to, um, we're not trying to sort of be the, the points program of all points programs. We're trying to actually be an engagement platform that's meaningful to people. So that's really why we're extending into areas that are uh, beyond the four walls of just hotel stays. Right. And so we're trying to really increase relevancy. It means deeper understanding of our guests and what they're looking for. Um, and that's really how we're going to focus our attention. I would only also offer that in a number of markets, we, we have very broad representation at Hyatt, but we don't necessarily have layers and layers of representation in every market. So you might pick a, there's a Midwestern market that will go unnamed, a secondary or tertiary market. Um, we have two properties in that market, and Marriott's got tw over 20. And the question that we ask ourselves is, is it, is it really important to have 20 properties in a very small market? Um, I think it's a, there's a proliferation strategy versus a, you know, a relevancy and, mm -hmm. and, um, and minimum, minimally viable presence. And that's really how we focused our attention. Um, Mark, your chief commercial officer, asks, no, that's not <laughs> um, how, it, how is Hyatt positioning itself to the high-end hotels guests in the wake of Star Wars becoming a part of Marriott? Well, I think we are the only, we're the sole remaining multi-brand, multinational hotel company that's hyper-focused on the high-end traveler. We are it. Starwood shared that position before they were acquired by Marriott, but I think now you've got um, the, the relatively larger hotel companies, Marriott, Hilton, IHG, Accor, that are really spanning across a very wide range of guests, and we're not. We have uh, all, of our, all of our guest focus is at the higher end, and, that's, and really the way we're gonna compete is not to try to play the scale game that they're playing, because getting on their playing field doesn't make any sense for us. Now, if you somehow magically zapped me into Arnie Sorensen's body and said, now you're running Marriott, I'm not sure I would run it differently than he is, but we think that differentiation through the experience and hyper-focusing on getting to know our, our guests, our higher-end guests better, and, and extending the brand is really the, way to, really the way to win. And it's been working. Our results have been actually remarkable. I'm, I'm particularly elated because after the merger, 
Marriott Starwood merger, a lot of the sell side analysts on Wall Street said, oh, there's only one thing that matters in this industry and that's scale. And we're proving them wrong. I'm very happy to be able to prove them wrong. All right, thank you, Mark. That Thanks. was great. Thanks.